Let's talk a little bit about QRP and uh, how QRP has developed over the years. Um, I know that the inspiration for me in, uh, in uh, low power communications was this book that was written by uh, a couple of classics, uh, Wes Hayward and Doug DeMaw back in the 70s. It was called Solid State Design for the Radio Amateur. This is where a lot of the, uh, a lot of the ideas came out for building your own equipment using solid state devices. Uh, this book, uh, QRP Power, uh, similarly uh, outlines some of these early radios and some of the newer radios. It gets into some uh, hardcore QRP that is uh, using very low power on the HF bands. So this is where a lot of it came out originally. Um, this little transceiver was my first full uh, transceiver that I built and I'm embarrassed to say I built it in 1981. It's a super heterodyne receiver using uh, the ideas out of the solid state design book, a dual gate MOSFET mixer, it uses a 1350 IF strip, and the transmitter has four crystal control channels. So you had a very simple transmitter that used a CB transistor in the out output and a single oscillator transistor on the input. So we used devices like this back in the day. We would rescue a final amplifier out of a CB radio, and we would use a usually a, a TO5 type transistor as the oscillator. And that would give us a couple watts with a crystal control transmitter. So this represents the, this 1970s idea of uh, QRP. Okay, let's look inside this uh, this transceiver that I built back in the early 80s. As you can see, it uses a lot of cordwood con construction. Quite a few parts in here. Anyway, this is a time capsule. This is looking back around 1980. Later on, some of these designs would develop into uh, famous radios like the NorCal 4040, uh, some of the Ramsey kits, the MFJ radios, and of course the Elcraft K2, which is very popular today. People really would like to build their own QRP transceivers like this, and there is a market for that in, out there. I want to introduce you to a, a different facet of uh, QRP, and I call it retro QRP. Uh, this is where we, instead of uh, studying toroid transformers and solid state devices and synthesizers and chips. We throw all of that away and we defer back to the old days where we used peanut tubes and other tube type equipment to do the same thing. So I'm going to show you a retro QRP station. We're going to use it on the air. Okay, let's take a peek at the, uh, the simple transmitter, the 6AK5 transmitter. As you can see, we have a crystal in a Colpitts uh, configuration. It's electron coupled into a high Q tank, and a link comes off the output. There's a loading control. There's sufficient Q here to make a, uh, a transmitter that has pretty good spurious uh, suppression. If you're nervous about spurious suppression at all, you should use a tuner uh, with a transmitter like this, or a simple uh, two pi section low pass filter. Um, I have not found any problems with simple transmitters like this causing interference to anyone, especially on 80 meters. i about uh, crystals. Almost any type of crystal will work with a transmitter like this, from the smallest sizes to the largest. The current uh, going through the crystals is very low with these small transmitters. The tubes are very forgiving uh, on the crystals. You can use everything from uh, uh, clock type crystals all the way up to the largest uh, crystals used in uh, World War II transmitters, and they'll work just fine. Well, here it is, the 6AK5. This comprises our transmitting tube. The little tube has a plate dissipation just over 1.5 watts, and we're asking it to put out a couple of watts which is acceptable in a CW situation. You'll notice that we had 250 volts on the plate of this little tube, even though its maximum ratings are 180 volts. 
Uh, the tube seems to take the extra voltage with no trouble at all on CW, and I have not seen any flashover or degradation. The tube does not overheat. Uh, we could use several tubes in a circuit like this. The uh, 6BA6 is a good choice. Uh, 6AU6. Uh, these are all acceptable uh, tubes to use in a uh, what I call a peanut whistle transmitter putting out 1 to 3 watts. Taking a close look at the little transmitter, we have the, uh, the crystal, which is the, the big guy. It's, it very much uh, makes the, uh, the tube look like a dwarf. I have a tube shield over the tube. We have the tuning capacitor and the output tank with the coupling link. Notice that we have a piece of galvanized steel that uh, acts as the ground plane, and we're building it on top of that ground plane. This is pretty good practice for a small transmitter, and the spurious output would be very low in a transmitter like this. Okay, let's listen to the tone on the transmitter. Getting a little over 2 watts out. 6AK5. Well, the receiver is even more interesting. This is the uh, one tube Morgan receiver from Alfred Morgan's uh, Boy's First Book of Radio and Electronics. And I don't think you could find a simpler receiver than this using the 2000 ohm headphones and the straight uh, tickler feedback in the Armstrong circuit with the trimmer off the antenna. This is going to be our 80 meter receiver. Now using a Morgan receiver is not that uh, interesting in itself, but uh, using it as a ham receiver and actually making contacts with it on 80 meters, now that's interesting because this is a very difficult to use receiver from the standpoint of band spread, meaning you turn the knob a little ways and you can go right through the CW portion of 80 meters lickety split uh, the regen control is also notoriously uh, difficult to adjust, so we'll have some fun making this work as our station receiver in the peanut whistle uh, QRP station. By the way, with the, uh, the Morgan and its plug-in coils, um, you could cover many different bands, including 40 meters, but I don't think the stability would be such that you could make much use of it on 40, although it's worth a try. On 80, it seems to have enough stability that you can actually use it on the bands. So um, a receiver like this, um, built on a board, uh, will benefit greatly from shielding if you can use some metallic shielding. Now, if you're interested in learning more about this receiver, I have a whole video series on this particular receiver that's worth looking at. It's a fun receiver to use, and you can wind coils for almost any shortwave band. Now, you may be asking, how are we going to take a one-tube receiver that's built to drive a pair of 2000 ohm headphones and have some audio output that we can record. Um, uh, the solution that I found was to use a small high impedance transformer. This transformer looks like uh, approximately 5000 ohms on the primary and it looks like about 600 ohms on the secondary. And that's just about perfect to drive a computer speaker. Now we're not going to have all the volume that we would have on a on a radio that would have many amplified stages, but I think we'll be able to get enough signal out of here that I can have my headphones hooked up simultaneously with the computer speaker, or I can just tune it with the computer speaker and we'll be able to hear the stations as I tune the radio.